The affordable housing plan is a tool used in the state of New Mexico because New Mexico has uh, an anti-donation clause. So you're not able, municipalities or uh, other government agencies cannot give or help uh, developers come in and work within blighted areas. Uh, economic development has the tool and that is through the Economic Development Act which gives them the availability when you're trying to recruit for jobs in, in, uh, in industry that you can use different things like the IRBs and making sure that you know you can you can give tax credits you can you can uh, do many many things to get jobs in and so this is the actual the the tool that the cities use or municipalities use to help with affordable housing and it is just it uh, is approved through the state through the mortgage finance authority and that's simply what it is each community can do their own whatever works for their community and most communities in New Mexico have an affordable housing plan. No, having an affordable housing plan does absolutely not make it a welfare pr uh, project and any any projects that we would have come in first off any project would have to go back to the City Commission for approval on on anything that falls under the affordable housing plan so no most affordable housing plans it's workforce housing or it's senior housing or it's a developer that wants to come in and take a blighted area and actually build single-family homes so absolutely not it is not a welfare uh, state or a welfare project you know we need an affordable housing plan because it's a way for our city to be able to work with developers that want to go into blighted areas the city owns lots that we've had to take through foreclosure or through other means you know in the older parts of town we have many many substandard homes in this community so so it's a way that we can help the developers either by you know helping them with permitting fees or helping them with a lot that the city owns right now because of the anti-donation clause we can't just give that or give it to a developer for a dollar in the Hotel Clovis's, uh, you know, with, with what we're doing with that, we're not even able to give that particular building or help a developer with that without an affordable housing plan. So this absolutely goes within our goals. It's in our comprehensive plan, which is established several years ago to, to work toward having an affordable housing plan. The way that we have it structured right now for Hotel Clovis with the developer is, is that we will grant and or loan him up to $1.4 million. And written in that contract with the developer is very clear directions and instructions on that he has to go out and find other grant supplies, money supplies, which he has done. Once we get the affordable housing plan, because we cannot do anything with this developer without the affordable housing plan because of the New Mexico's anti-donation clause. But once we have the affordable housing plan, then we're able to work with the developer. We can give him the building, deed that over to him, which honestly that building has negative value right now because it has nothing in it. And, um, and so we can deed that over to, to the developer and then we can work with him and have committed to him for up to $1.4 million. And, but he has already has located a $400,000 grant from the Federal Home Loan uh, Bank in Dallas. The city will generate, what this project generates is $650,000 in gross receipts tax, 300000 of that stays within the community. So that's another 300000 that we can take off of the $1.4 million. Plus there's a USDA grant that the city's looking at that will help put in streets and some of the infrastructure. That comes off of the loan and or, and or grant, as well as we're looking at a grant from uh, EDA, the Environmental I mean, excuse me, the Economic Development Administration. So we believe that the city, you know, will that that will not be 1.4 million, but worst case scenario, it will be. But we truly believe it will be somewhere uh, much, much under 1 million. Right now, we cannot lend or give the building or anything that we want to do of Hotel Clovis to anyone, including the developer, because again of the New Mexico anti-donation uh, clause. But uh, like the affordable housing plan, like I said earlier, that's why it was put into place several years ago by the state. It gave a vehicle, a tool to use for this for this exact kind of project. And this one is, is wonderful because it's an old building that's been sitting there since, actually boarded up since 1985. And so legally we cannot do anything with it right now to help the developer. But once this affordable housing plan goes into effect, we can, we are able to grant 
loan, give, whatever we want to help with infrastructure, whatever we need to do. And again, this tool is used throughout New Mexico and throughout actually the country. So it's not anything new and it's just new for Clovis. It's something that we probably should have done many, uh, many years ago. You know, it's been quoted in the paper, and I know that some of the some of the people that's actually against this, their one of their quotes is that this would take us a slippery slope to socialism, and I just I find that you know just kind of um, ironic because this is what traditionally people really like to work. Is I'm, I'm going to use Hotel Clovis as the example. Uh, this will be a municipality working with a private developer. The private developer has over $9 million in investors and his own money into this project. Worst case scenario for Clovis in, would be $1.4 million. So that is a, that's, that's really, in, in my opinion, that's definitely not a socialism. Uh, that is working with private industry to capital, you know, a capitalistic market that works with private industry uh, to its highest degree. Uh, the city will not own the building anymore. We own it right now. So we will not own it when, when the developer takes it over. So I don't understand that, that philosophy that thinks it's socialism because my understanding of socialism is when government runs everything, government does everything. In this case, the government owns the building and we're going to be actually giving it to or working with the developer to take it over and work to develop, uh, renovate a, a really blighted area of our community. It provides home. It provides uh, affordable housing, which we so desperately need here. It provides jobs. It provides gross receipts tax. It puts it. It puts the property. I think this is a good point to make. It puts the property back on the tax rolls because the city owns it. It's not on the tax rolls. They're not paying property tax. So once the developer owns it, it goes back on the tax rolls. The the county and the city will collect the property taxes. So in my opinion, it would be totally opposite of socialism. It's uh, working within the free market, working with the uh, with developers, private investors, private developers. One of the investors in this is Berkshire Hathaway, which I think we all know that company. It's a uh, Warren Buffett's company, and and uh, he he likes this kind of project. So I um, I truly do not think this is a slippery slope to socialism. I think that's uh, actually I believe that's. Um, that's just rhetoric that has been kind of out there on the federal level and trying to bring it down to the local level. But this is Clovis, and we're here about Clovis and doing what's best for this community. One of the questions that I've been asked is if, if the person supports the affordable housing plan, will their taxes increase? Absolutely not. The affordable uh, housing plan doesn't have anything to do with property taxes. It has everything to do with working with developers, coming into the community, working in blighted areas, and only helping them in in small ways, such as per, you know forgiving uh, partial permitting fees, uh, working with developers, and it, you know it kind of depends on the size of the project. But we're able to give a a lot in in a blighted area of town. So no, it does not affect people's property taxes at all. As a matter of fact, it brings us back taxes by putting you know, things back on the tax roll that the city may own and any projects that comes in would be uh, subject to gross receipts tax which helps our community. You know, I have been asked because we have done a lot over the past few months. Clovis in the past has traditionally just grown very steadily and there's been many things that Clovis has needed and wanted and we just really didn't move it forward. Right now, our kids' activities are nil. You know, we, we just received, uh, just last week, the YMCA coming back into town. But one of the things that I was, was asked when I was running for mayor was, what are you going to do about our kids? They have really absolutely nothing to do. There's no activities. There's no summer camps. There's nothing. There's, there's not any organized things. There's organized sports. But there's not anything that puts them into swimming lessons or anything like that. So, so that was one of the, the critical things that I heard. And, uh, and many, about 15 years ago, the city came up with the parks plan. And that plan was to, to get an 18-hole golf course. And then when that happened, Muni, the municipal golf course, would be turned into a beautiful park system, which would include soccer fields, which would include walking trails and, and, uh, and things just for the family. So the Colonial Park Country Club was listed on the market uh, a few months ago and 
was we were approached by some citizens that lives around the, the golf course and that actually plays golf that if the city would be interested in buying the country club. Al Gordo had just done it and Murillo was looking at a country club. Many, many communities have done that because it's a, it's a cheaper way to get an 18-hole course. We did surveys. Clovis was one of the only communities, in, in fact the only community, that did not have a municipal 18-hole golf course. So we felt like the opportunity was there. When the parks plan was put together, they looked at doing an 18-hole course out at Ned Hout Park. But that would, right now, if you go, and you can Google this, and anybody can go check this out. If you go and try to put in a new golf course right now, you're looking at a minimum of 12 million, 10 to $12 million. So that's just not feasible. We couldn't do that. But when, uh, but when the country club came up for sale, we looked at that, uh, got an appraisal, bought it. What what the city felt like was, you know, was was a very good deal for both, for a good transaction for both parties, and bought the country club. So we can have the 18-hole golf course that the city has wanted for 15 years. This is not my idea or this particular commission's idea. It's been a it's been an ongoing wish and dream for years for our kids. So what that will do is the municipal course will now become a, a within our master parks plan. That will be the zoo, expansion of the zoo, soccer fields, walking trails, the splash park, and other entities for the family. Now, you ask, is this going to be, will this bankrupt the city? Absolutely not. First off, I don't want to bankrupt this city. I live here. I've lived here almost all my life. My kids, li my daughter lives here and my grandkids live here. So why would I want to bankrupt the city? Of course it won't. Clovis is a very frugal community and that and that and there's much much good in that. But comes but what comes with that is that we're a little behind on making sure that everything's taken care of. So what was determined, we had our bond council uh, representative, Mr. Kevin Powers, come in and talk to us about what, how we can finance some of the things we need. You know, you can have all the plans that you can draw up and they sit on the shelf until you figure out funding. So what we did, we figured out how we can fund. We are going to refinance some bonds. We actually, uh, I, I think it's a very wise move because we're saving interest rates. We had high, higher interest rates on our bonds. So we refinance our bonds. We pull out enough money to pay for the golf course. And with the money that we're going to pull out and with the grant that we were given by found a local Sisler Foundation here in Clovis, which was a half a million dollars, and then a grant actually that we just found out with the YMCA, we were able to do this and not go up a dime, I want to understand that, a dime on taxes. In fact, our payment will remain the same and we're able to do all of this for our community. So within just a few months, our children are going to have, be able to have summer camp. We're going to renovate the YRB, the old youth recreation building, so they can run summer camp out of there. We're going to uh, build a splash pad, a splash park, and we're going to do all these things because it's all about the children, and that's what we're going to do. So absolutely not, we're not going to bankrupt. Now on the water issue, we did a tax for 10 years, and we were asked by this particular group to make sure that you had a sunset in it and that you had it definitely described, and we did. It was for the Ute Water Project. This community gets our water situation and we are taking care of it proactively. This water is not going to be used next week or next year but it will be here again for our children and grandchildren. So this was a proactive move by the city. We went up for 10 years and that will take care of Clovis's part. So absolutely we're not bankrupting the, the city. We're not spending money wild and foolishly. I've been called and so we're just out of control. No we're not. We are doing what we should have been doing for many, many years, taking care of problems. And Hull Street Bridge is a good example. That is uh, just about three years ago, that bridge started falling apart. And so we had to take care of it. So we went out, we found the funding, we put it together, and we saved from, from, what, we, from what our bid was and what the actual job came in. We saved over $2 million because of going out and getting all the bids that we had come in. And we're able to put that toward some more highway uh, improvements out on Mabry Drive. So this is a very frugal community. We work hard. Our administration works hard to make sure that everything is accounted for. It's very transparent and I welcome anyone to go down to City Hall at any time and look through the budget and you will see that that's, you know, that, that everything is, a, is there and accounted for. And so actually I'm very proud of our community that we're moving forward. You know, what I would say to a citizen that, that comes up to me and, and tells me or asks me, you know, that they don't want to do anything because we pay too much tax already. Well, we, we did a chart of Clovis's taxes.
And call this as gross receipts tax. Before the Ute water, we were down in the bottom third. With our Ute water increase, we are right in the middle. Maybe the middle right up, you know, ab right above the middle. But we're still right in the middle of other communities. You know, we all love to go over to Lubbock and Amarillo and shop. And their sales tax is 8.25. We don't think anything about it. Ours, with the new, um, with what the Ute water project will be, will be uh, 7.85. So we're still in good shape there. Property taxes. Clovis's property taxes are one of the cheapest in the state. As a matter of fact, when we looked at a survey of most of the communities, especially in our area and our size, even bigger, we were in the bottom third, way toward the bottom on property taxes. So we we are we are very uh, we're not taxed as much as other places. I know people don't like to pay taxes. In fact, you know, at one of our meetings, someone got up and said, you know, don't spend my money. Well, you know, I understand that, except it's not just your money; it's my money because I pay taxes as, as you know as, as much as anyone else. It's our money, and it's all we need to work work it like it's our money and work together for what's good. So, so we as as far as what the state is, we are either in the middle or down in the bottom as far as our tax structure. You know, one thing I would like to point out on this affordable housing plan is there's been a lot of confusion out there uh, on is it um, is it the HUD voucher system? Is it what is it affordable housing? Is it subsidized? And through the affordable housing plan. The, uh, the again, it has to go to the commission to be approved. But there's not anything that's really subsidized or subsidized through the through the HUD voucher. Now, what the what the Hotel Clovis uh, affordable housing will be is for workforce housing. That's what it's called, and you can make up to uh, probably you know over thirty thousand dollars at least a year, and you have to have a job. You have to qualify. And you have to, um, you know, be able to to prove that you can make the payments. The payments are not subsidized except through the way that this works. It's tax credits. Like I said, you know, the, an investor buys the tax credits. So when an investor buys the tax credits, they are getting credit from the federal government. Just like oil companies get uh, federal tax credits, they get tax benefits. Well, so do other big businesses. So that's what this is. It's a tax credit program. And so the people that rent, it has to meet certain guidelines. It has to be affordable housing. You have to work. You have to, you know, make a certain amount of money. And then um, you pay rent. You don't, you know, you, your rent is not subsidized. So the rent starts at $350 for a one bedroom. And now this, this is what has been talked about to date. That's not all completely, totally finished. But that starts at $350 and it goes up to the three bedroom at uh, $750. So then somewhere in between there will be the one, two, and three bedrooms. So it is not subsidized. It is not welfare. It is simply affordable housing for, for working families or a working single mom or a single dad. Uh, in fact, m many of our city workers would be able to qualify for, for this housing. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not the, the thing that's being put out there. It's something that's desperately needed in our community with Cannon Air Force Base. Uh, Cannon Air Force Base is in favor of an affordable housing plan. They, uh, they think that there's been a need for a long time. So this will get us there. And again, it is not subsidized. It is simply uh, a way for people to get into a nice place to live through a tax credit program that will get us to this point. You know, I'd like to talk a little bit about Cannon Air Force Base. I've been in several meetings, and back when we were put on the BRAC list, you know, we were willing to do anything in our power to get off that list. We lined the streets by the thousands. We, we had all the BRAC commissioners but two come in, and we worked, worked very hard as a community to, to get us a new mission, which we did. We were very blessed with the mission that we received. And as the people came in, the base started getting bigger and bigger. They predicted at first it was going to be, in, you know, the official numbers were 4,200. Then it was 5,200. Now the official figure is over 6,000 people. And that really is probably going to, was going to grow from there. Well, what happened, they came into town. They started coming in a little quicker than, than I think what they really thought. And our housing, especially the rental market, is in short supply. We do not have enough rentals in this community to to really give the availability of nice places for people to live. So Cannon Air Force Base is here to stay. We were very blessed to get this mission because we all know that special operations, especially in light of what's happened the last couple, three weeks with 
uh, Osama bin Laden with uh, special operations taking him out. So this is where it's going. This is the way the wars are going to be fought. So our base is only going to continue to grow. So we need to meet these needs. We need to do what we said we would do in the beginning and work for affordable housing. It's just it's just very simple that we we approach this. We work in any any way that we can. You know, we need to work for the for Hotel Clovis because that does so many things. It brings a brings a beautiful building back to life. It gives us affordable housing for our base and our community people, and works in a helps in a blighted area. Gives us retail downtown, a restaurant downtown. It is a win 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 for everyone. And Cannon Air Force Base is proud to call Cannon uh, actually proud to call Clovis their home. They're glad to be here, but we need to do our part too to, to make sure that we take care of them to the very best of our ability. Uh, there's been a lot of money already spent on Hotel Clovis. You know, it, it was boarded up, I believe, in the mid 80s, and the city did not own it at that time. It was a private owner that, that, that took it over, and they tried to do things with it, just they were not able to do it. Then that ended up with, with another group, and, and they wanted to make um, some type of housing and, or assisted living for uh, vets, I believe is what it was, and that didn't work out. And then it ended up that they, they couldn't pay everything that it, that it took to keep it up. And so the city had to foreclose on it, go in and pay for all of the, you know, the cleaning it up and everything and boarding it up. So they've spent, I don't know, that was probably $50,000 at the time. And then since then, before a developer would even look at the hotel, we had to clean it out environmentally. It had uh, uh, pigeon droppings in it all throughout the building. We all know that. We remember the pigeons that were down there. It had asbestos and it has uh, had lead-based paint. So it was an environmental mess. So through grants and through what the city did, we've spent about 500000 I believe, on cleanup. We have about another hundred to go, which we still have the grant money to do some lead-based paint cleanup. So, so we're in the building probably between five and six hundred thousand already. Now, to take the building down, uh, it is two million dollars, and we do have that quote, and that that quote does not include cleaning it up. So that's just to bring the building down. I talked to a uh, a person that was involved with with the quote and kind of knew what they were talking about and said that 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 building is built unbelievable. They don't build buildings like that anymore. It's total, total concrete. So it's different on how you have to bring it down and it's quite expensive. So it's two million dollars just to blow it up and then you've got to go in and clean it and then put something else there. And so you're looking at three million dollars in my opinion to, to get all that cleaned up. And, and then we don't have our hotel. We don't have our beautiful landmark that we all re have memories of going to different functions there and a, 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 a landmark that was built in 1932 in the depths of the depression when people needed jobs just like we are now people need jobs we're coming out of our recession but we need jobs and this provides 156 construction jobs and then several permanent jobs with between the retail and the management that's going to be running the hotel and uh, so in like I said earlier it's 650,000 in gross receipts tax that the state and county and city get to participate in and we all need it so it's uh, it's it doesn't even make sense to me it's not even good business sense you know people say well, you need to run the city like a business well it's really not a business but in this case let's look at that it's going to cost us two million minimum up to probably three million to take it down and figure out something else to do with it and clean it up or we can spend very worst case scenario 1.4 million and it won't be that much because of the grants and things that we believe we have lined up but let's say that 1.4 million so do the math do the math it is it's it is common sense and it is a business decision to make when you look at all the benefit the jobs, the blighted area cleaned up, the hotel brought back to life. When you look at everything that we're trying to do in our downtown area, it is absolutely, in my opinion, it's not. there's not even a decision. One of the things I've been uh, asked about too is, well, what's the developer like? Is he reputable? Well, we've done our due diligence on that. Mr. Crozier has an impeccable reputation. He has great credit. He has these projects all over the state and all over other areas. Uh, we worked. We talked to the head of the, Mr. Montoya with uh, MFA, 
the Mortgage Finance Authority, who administers these tax credits and works with different developers. And they said their quote was, he is one of the best that you could get. We really like working with him because he does his due diligence. He's on the ball. He pays his bills. He's, he's got, he has several projects around the state, and none of them have ever had any problems. And they, they look beautiful. You can drive up to them right now today, and, and they look as good as the day that they were built. So we feel very fortunate that the, the only one person answered our, our RFP for the Hotel Clovis one and that was Mr. Crozier and so uh, and he is very very close to making this happen and and working toward Clovis's dream of Hotel Clovis coming back to life. You know the, I've, I have also been asked this and I know that it's kind of the talk is that why is this one for Hotel Clovis going to work when the others didn't? Well I guess my answer would be why won't it? You know, we've worked we've worked very diligently with this developer. He came in three and a half years ago. We went out after we cleaned it up, we went out for RFP. And uh, there was one person that answered it, and that was Mr. Crozier. And the difference is I believe this time is that the city is really working with this developer. The city gets it. We understand what we need to do. The developer is one of the best in the state to do this type of project. He has a passion for our building. He has a passion for the hotel. In fact, he told me, he said, you know, Mayor, he said, you just don't even know what you have. Your community has a jewel that needs to be brought back to life. He likes these kind of projects. He is a very energy conscious uh, developer. This is going to be a LEED Platinum building, uh, which is one of the, if, I think it's the first that in the state for a commercial building. Especially, I know it's the first for a renovation. And uh, so he loves the project. He has the money to do it. I, I want, you know, I hope that everybody can understand that he has nine million dollars already secured. He has that, and so he ha he has the investors that believe in him, and Mr. Crozier believes in Clovis. And so I would just like to ask us that if we could believe in ourselves, because this is the time that we can make it happen. I truly believe that, but we have to just move forward, and we have to make sure that everybody understands what this is about and this is a dream that can come true if we will just cling on jump on and believe in it because it it will happen if we can get through some of these hoops that we've been we've been trying to get through Mr. Crozier can finish up some of his things that he has to get through so I believe very strongly that this this is going to work if the if the Tea Party gets enough signatures on the petition and it go and then, then of course we know that it goes to a vote just like they did on a quarter percent and um, now in my opinion it will not fail but let's say that it did fail then it would jeopardize and probably would not the hotel clothes I don't see how we could do it because we can't give we, we can't work within the guidelines of his investors and do anything any different um, we have to work with the affordable housing plan to give him the building and then to work with the uh, the loan and or grant so so by signing the petition you take the risk of this beautiful project not happening now it is your right and it is your freedom as we all know that you can you can have your voice and you can go out and you can you know express your opinion and, and we we all believe in that right but the city the city commission voted on this uh, seven to one and you elected the city commission and you elected me uh, to, to move the city forward and that's what we feel like that we're doing so in my opinion instead of having these negative votes on everything taking it back to the public which it is the right to do I think it's better if you just you know if you have an opinion or if it's something different than what we're doing or you don't like what we're doing the election is in March and my seat's up and so are four other commissioners so I would just encourage you to run you know I really think that's the best way to have your voice instead of going to the taxpayers again for you know in my opinion for a waste of money for another election when your commission who you voted on voted for this seven to one so I would encourage you not to sign the petition I would encourage you to learn more about this and actually get on board with it because it's a beautiful Clovis project that we can all be proud of this whole community it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or what side of town you live on uh, Hotel Clovis is about Clovis and it's about us and so I hope that we can all work together because really as you know we there's not in my opinion 
There shouldn't be Democrats or Republicans or Tea Party or anything else because we are the people of Clovis for Clovisites. And we need to work together for what's better for this community. So I would encourage you to get on board. Please support Hotel Clovis. Please support our affordable housing plan because that really goes further than even Hotel Clovis. Our affordable housing plan is one thing. Hotel Clovis is another. So uh, we're moving the city forward and we will continue to do so. So I uh, just encourage you to get on board. There's several places you can get in other information on this, and one of them is, of course, through the City of Clovis website. There's actually the affordable housing plan is posted, as well as any of the information on Hotel Clovis. There's also clovisprogress.com. That's a group of grassroots citizens that's put together a web page, and they have all the information, as well as there's Facebook postings with uh, Clovis Progress as well. You know, again, we've talked about the information out there and the misinformation that's out there. Well, one of the things that we've been talking about is because it's in a historic building, part of it, you know, cannot be changed, and that part is the ballroom. And that ballroom will stay just like it is, renovated, of course, but it'll still be the old ballroom that many of us remember. Now, there is a daycare center within the confines near the ballroom, and uh, the, the ballroom could be used as an overflow for the kids if they're doing an assembly or something like that in the ballroom. But the ballroom is really designed and will be used by the community for receptions, events, an art gallery, and it can also be used from the residents there at the hotel, including the kids in the daycare. So it's a multi-use, but it is the ballroom. It's marked on the plans the ballroom, and so it will be left intact so, and it goes out to the second floor balcony, I think, is probably a lot of people remember.